When we're integrating over a region that's circular or part of a circle, it's often easier to use polar coordinates instead of Cartesian coordinates. This video explains how. Suppose we want to integrate the function x squared y over the region d, where d is the top half of the disk with center at the origin and radius 5. It would certainly be possible to compute this integral using ordinary Cartesian coordinates, but because the boundary of the region is partly a circle, it ends up being much easier to use polar coordinates. In order to use polar coordinates, I'm going to need to convert my x's and y's to r's and theta's using the equations x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta. I'm also going to need to find the bounds of integration in terms of r and theta. Finally, instead of writing dA as dx dy, I'm going to write dA as r dr d theta. You may be wondering, why do we have this extra factor of r here? We didn't have an extra factor of x or y when we used Cartesian coordinates. I'll give an informal justification here. For a more formal justification, please see the next video. Remember that an integral is a limit of a Riemann sum. To compute the Riemann sum in Cartesian coordinates, we divide our region into little tiny Cartesian rectangles. The area of each one of these rectangles is going to be delta x times delta y, where delta x is the width in this direction and delta y is the width in that direction. But when we compute the Riemann sum in polar coordinates, we think of dividing up our region that's somewhat circular into little polar rectangles. That is, little shapes that are bounded by rays through the origin on two sides and bounded by arcs of circles on the other two sides. If two of the rays have an angle of delta theta between them and two of the circles have a difference in radius of delta r, then the area of the little polar rectangle bounded by the rays and arcs, which I'll still call delta A, it's not equal to delta R times delta theta. Instead, it's approximately equal to delta R times R delta theta. That's because these side lengths here are approximately equal to delta R, but these side lengths here are approximately equal to r delta theta because to get the arc length along a circle, you multiply the angular displacement by the radius to get out there. This makes sense, right? Because if you have twice as big a circle, like twice the radius, then you'd have twice the arc length to get through the same bit of angle. So this approximate area of delta r times r d theta becomes our area element r d r d theta when we do the integral. Now that we've outlined the setup, let's go ahead and compute this integral. First, we'll convert the x squared y that we're integrating into polar coordinates. So x is r cosine theta and y is r sine theta. So, so that simplifies to r cubed cosine squared theta sine theta. Next, we need to find the bounds of integration in terms of r and theta. We can do this by writing the region in terms of polar coordinates. So this region D is the set of points with R theta, where R is between 0 and 5, since 5 is the radius of the circle, and theta is between 0 and pi, since the region extends from the positive x-axis, where theta is 0, to the negative x-axis, where theta is pi. The bounds on r and theta become our bounds of integration. r goes from 0 to 5, and theta goes from 0 to pi. I'll copy down the function that I'm integrating, so that's r cubed cosine squared theta sine theta, and then we need to include the area element, which is always r dr d theta for polar coordinates. This integral simplifies to the integral of r to the fourth cosine squared theta sine theta dr d theta. We need to integrate with respect to r first, that's our inner integral. 
But since cosine squared theta sine theta is a constant with respect to r, we can pull that constant multiple outside this integral sign. Furthermore, this whole integral here, once I compute it, will just be a number. So I can pull this constant multiple out of this integral sign. Now I have a product of two separate integrals, each one involving only one variable, which will make it a little bit easier to work with. This is a handy trick that always works if your original integrand is a product of a function of one variable times a function of the other variable, and your bounds of integration are all numbers. To compute the integral of r to the fourth dr, I just get r to the fifth over five, and I can compute the integral of cosine squared theta sine theta d theta by doing a u substitution. I'll let u be cosine theta, so du is negative sine theta d theta. And I'll go ahead and convert the bounds of integration as well. So when theta is zero, u is going to be one, and when theta is pi, u is going to be negative one. So I'll rewrite this integral, and I'll integrate to get negative u cubed over three, evaluated between negative one and one, times the rest of my problem. After some arithmetic, this works out to 1,250 over three. The method used in the previous problem works more generally. If f is any continuous function on a polar rectangle, by that I mean a region that's a collection of points with coordinates r and theta, where theta is between two constants and r is between two constants, then we can evaluate the integral of the function in polar coordinates by converting x in terms of r and theta converting y in terms of r and theta, writing the area element r dr d theta, and letting r range between its bounds, a and b, and let theta range between its bounds, alpha and beta. Please do remember to write down the r dr d theta. It's easy to get into trouble by omitting the r or omitting the area element altogether. In this video, we computed the integral on a semicircular region by converting to polar coordinates.